Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JS Box Kraal harmonizations. Today we are starting a relatively epic saga where we are going to be completing the analysis of all the Kraals from the St. Matthew Passion. It's my personal favorite of Box Passions, and uh, there are a ton of Kraals in the uh, work. Um, if you are interested in checking out some other corrals that belong to this work, I have analyzed a few of them, I believe, and I will include those episodes, or at least the episode number, so you can go along in the playlist and find them yourself in the description. But I'm very excited for the next several episodes because St. Matthew Passion, I've always wanted to look at the uh, at the, the work more in detail, and here I am actually doing that. So today we're looking at Hetz Liebste Jesu, uh, Vast hast du verbrochen, sorry, my computer screen, or my camera was in the way of my screen, I had to pan my head over. Uh, that roughly translates to, ah, holy Jesus, how hast thou offended? The relatively short chorale, um, fairly harmonically straightforward, um, really not too much to say in regards to the harmonic activity here. All of the harmony is more or less functional. We have two sharps in the key signature. We start on B minor, we end on B major. I reckon the overall tonality of this chorale is B minor. Starting with our complete first measure, we have E, E, G, and B. That's E minor in root position, which is four passing tone in the bass. And then we have G, B, D, and B. I think one could make the argument this is a G major chord, of course, because the tones are there. However, I think this D might be an accented non-chord tone, and rather this E is our um, more likely tone to occur here, like 4 going to 4, 6, or 6. They're really, for all intents and purposes, the same chord in this context. One analysis, I feel, just looks a little bit cleaner on the page and also spells kind of a harmonic idea that Bach does often where he takes a certain length of time in the harmonic uh, rhythm and devotes it to taking a chord and inverting it again. We then have F sharp, C sharp, F sharp, and A sharp with the leading tone in the melody, which is interesting. That is our five chord, F sharp major, passing tones in the melody and tenor before we get F sharp, A sharp, C sharp, and F sharp again. That's another F sharp major chord, no need to reanalyze. Passing tone in the bass, more specifically a passing seventh. We then get D, B, F sharp, and B, which is B minor in first inversion, one six. And then we get F sharp, A sharp, F sharp, and C sharp, which is our five chord, F sharp major. We then have B, B, F sharp, and D. Again, another tonic triad in root position. Passing tone in the tenor. And then we get another B minor triad. B, D, F sharp, and D. Uh, no need to reanalyze. We then have A sharp, C, F sharp, and E natural, which is uh, F sharp 7 over A sharp, 5, 6, 5. And as we're closing in on our half cadence here in the key of B minor, we have B, B, F sharp, and D. Our tonic triad again. And then we get F-sharp major, F-sharp, A-sharp, F-sharp, and C-sharp, regular old five chord. So all things considered, we have an entire phrase of just one, four, and five, maybe a six chord in there, but for all intents and purposes, it's a very straightforward phrase, not too much going on, um, lots of ones and five chords proportionately. Okay, looking ahead to our next phrase, uh, we end in a perfect authentic cadence in the key of D major. So... I'm really not, uh, uh, I, I'm convinced that we are modulating before this A natural here. I don't see any reason to tarry along in the key of B minor longer than we need to. It does feel like we open the phrase with a 5-1 cadence, though. F sharp, A sharp, F sharp, and C sharp is another F sharp major chord. No need to reanalyze. Then we have B, B, F sharp, and D, which is our tonic triad, B minor. That, I also believe, is our gateway to the key of D major. It is our sixth chord. We then have A natural, C sharp, A natural again, and E. That is A major in root position, which is our five chord. And then we have a bit of a cadential progression here, 5 going to 1, D, D, A, and F sharp, our tonic triad, D major. Passing 7th in the tenor here, and a passing tone in the melody leads us to G, B, G, and D. That's G major, which is our 4 chord now, not our 6 chord like we saw earlier because we're in D major. And then we have 3 passing tones, which 
especially when the bass is moving, I'm inclined to think that there is some harmonic activity, but alas, we have A, C sharp, A, and D, which is not likely a chord in the key of D major. This We, we know that there's sort of like a passing five going on here, but uh, the fact that the D is being suspended means that this is a chord that we can talk about, but it's not going to make it onto the page. It's not going to make the cut. Uh, but afterwards, we have B, D, G, and G. That's G major in the first inversion. So we'll just change the figure base to six. No need to reiterate the Roman numeral. And then we get C sharp, E, A, and G. That's A7 over C sharp. Another 5, 6, 5 chord. We've seen one before as well. It's not a... Um, a7 chord, it's an F-sharp 7 chord here, but still we've seen 5, 6, 5 chords. And then we go, um, not to D major, but actually to another A major-ish chord. We have D, E, A, and F-sharp. I guess you could analyze this as some sort of like D major triad with a 9-8 suspension in the uh, tenor here. That's one way I think we could look at it, but actually I think this is all in all, a deceptive progression of sorts where this D is an accent and non-chord tone as well as this F sharp, and we have C sharp, E, A, and E, which would be taking our 5, 6, 5 chord, putting it in root position, and then, uh, sorry, adding, uh, taking away the 7th, so that's what the 8 means, and then putting it in first inversion, so 8, 6, 3, and I'm adding the 3 there to be careful. I'm not sure if we could omit that 3. I'm sure we could figure it out, but um, using the entire Roman, oh, or sorry, the entire figured base doesn't hurt anyone. We then have B, D, D, and F sharp, that is B minor in root position, or our six chord. Again, sort of a longer idea of a deceptive progression, five going to six, passing seventh in the bass, passing tone in the alto, before we get G, D, B, and E, which is E minor seven over G, two, six, five. We know that Bach loves two, six, five chords. And then we would typically expect a five chord after that, A, C sharp, A, and E, A major, which is our five chord, passing seventh in the alto, and then we cadence on D major, D, A, F sharp, and D, our tonic triad. Okay, looking ahead, we have another half cadence in the key of uh, B minor, and we're looking for a point on which we modulate, but I don't think we modulate until much closer to the cadence, I suppose, because D major and B minor have a lot of diatonic chord. They're, I mean, they're, uh, they share a pitch collection before you make any chromatic alterations. So um, I guess any chord could be um, a chord that pivots over to the uh, like complementary key, uh, depending on uh, how liberal you are with your changes or like how... Uh, flexible of a relationship you have with the chord, but I tend to be more context-based, and I think that certain chords going from one to the next and in, in compliance with the melody as well tend to uh, make the sound feel more major versus minor. But anyways, I think we stay in D major for a pretty long time here, even though we start off the phrase with a B minor chord, B, B, F sharp, and D. I hear that as six, with a passing seventh in the tenor. E, G, E, and C sharp. Uh, this F sharp is a passing tone. This is C sharp diminished in first inversion. That is our first seven chord uh, that we've seen in the chorale, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's true. And then we get a bit of a transitive progression. It's been a while since I've, I, I feel like I haven't talked about transitive progressions in a while. Um, the idea that the falling fifth sequence, meaning you can, uh, I guess every interval uh, the second, the third, and the fourth, you can uh, traverse the entire scale without hearing the same note twice. Um, the falling fifths sequence, or the ascending fourth sequence, is uh, like kind of like a hallmark of uh, like the Baroque sound. At least it's something that I've very much associated with the Baroque sound, that sequence of chords that are a fifth below or a fourth above. And I feel like that serves as like a template of the path of least resistance from chord to chord. Um, and like I said, it's very uh, typical of the sound that we would expect. So a transitive progression suggests that the same voice leading can take you in the opposite direction. So if seven wants to go, or sorry, if four wants to go to seven, there's really no reason why we can't go to um, four as well. 
Uh, like in this case right here, we have C sharp diminished going to G major, G, G, D, and B, which is our four chord. It's the same voice leading. We can go from one direction to the next, but here we're seeing it um, move from one chord to the other, which is just approaching another dominant or opening up another pathway for progression. I typically find that transitive progressions lead to a or they are a vessel that prolongs the progression, whereas the cycle of falling fifths tends to be more of a direct route to the dominant. The transitive, a transitive progression tends to extend the um, idea of approaching a dominant and um, prolonging it until later, which is what Bach does here. We also have a passing seventh in the tenor in less interesting news. C sharp, E, E, and A is A over C sharp. That's 5, 6. This A is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. And then we get D major, D, A, D, and F sharp, our tonic triad. Passing tones in the upper voices before we get D, D, F sharp, and A again. However, we see this C natural here. This immediately indicates to me that there is a change of function. This D major chord is no longer our tonic, but rather 5, of four. D also happens to be the dominant of G, which we know is our four chord in our previous analysis, passing seventh in the bass. And then we get an interesting chord here. We get B, D, F sharp, and A. Now, I think in the same way that sort of this chord right here could be analyzed uh, as a six chord, I feel like contextually speaking, Bach is just this, this descending bass line that basically outlines kind of like an E minor scale going on here with D at the top and D sharp at the bottom, that uh, diminished octave, which is very interesting, um, this diminished octave outline. Uh, I think it's more likely that this is actually a D major chord, D, F sharp, and A is here, but this B is an accent and non-chord tone. I guess you could call this a six chord in the key of... Um, D major, but I think it's more likely, or I guess more specifically, a B minor 7 chord, a 6 7 chord. But I feel like actually what's happening is this chord is turning into second inversion, A, D, F sharp, and A. And that's totally kosher. Um, passing 6 4 chords are usually the context that we see 6 4 chords used in a mid phrase context. Um, just because. Uh, I, I don't know, I guess the voice leading is smoother. We often see them in these rapid uh, subdivisional contexts as well, where there are lots of voices moving, or I guess the bass is moving more quickly. Uh, we don't typically see them on uh, quarter notes, where the fifth of the chord stays in the bass for a long time. Uh, sometimes we do, though, but the majority of the time we don't. At least not uh, it isn't something that I've been like ultra conscious about. It hasn't been like the number one thing I've been looking for, uh, but I feel like that's just what I intuit. And as I've analyzed, I'm trying to go and index everything that I've analyzed so far. I haven't really encountered uh, six four chords outside of a passing context in the middle of the phrase, and they're usually uh, it, they're usually a byproduct of a bass line similar to this one. Um, not as uh, extreme in terms of the fact that it's just one long descending bass line, but rather it is a passing figure and it usually is part of some type of subdivision or uh, in eighth notes in the bass, at least. And afterwards we get G major, G, D, G, and B, which is our four chord, and I think this is where we modulate to the key of B minor. G major is now our six chord. We also have a passing seventh in the bass, we then have E, C, F sharp, and A. Again, I think this E is an accent to non-chord tone. Kind of strengthens this analysis here where the inner um, pair of eighth notes are the non-chord tones and the outer pair of eighth notes are the chord tones. D sharp, C, F sharp, and A. Another secondary dominant that's D sharp fully diminished seventh. Seven, seven of four, because D sharp's the leading tone to E, and E is our four chord in the key of B minor, not two, because we are now in the key of B minor rather than in D major, like we were before. And then we go to E minor, E, B, uh, F sharp, and G. This F sharp is a 9-8 suspension over the bass, and this D sharp is just an enclosure, right? We're just surrounding this E, which is the target of this F sharp, this down-by-step resolution, which is typically how uh, suspensions function. So still our four chord is what we would expect here. On this beat, we also get E, B, 
E and G as well, so no need to reanalyze. This A sharp is a non chord tone, this B is a chord tone, and then we get A sharp, C sharp, E, and F sharp. Very interesting, we get an inverted five chord, and it is a seven chord as well, so five, six, five. I think we have cadenced on five, six, five before, maybe once. Uh, but it doesn't ring any bells, and this might actually be unprecedented, but I do feel like this cadence right here, harmonically speaking, does have um, a very beautiful, unique profile to it because of this second here in the upper two voices. We have E natural and F sharp, and that is a really crunchy and, um, for Vox time, a surprisingly modern sound, especially when it's uh, emphasized at the end of a phrase. So very cool stuff. And we're going to wrap up the chorale in the key of B minor. It ends in a perfect authentic cadence. We go from 5, 6, 5 to 1, B, B, D, and F sharp. Um, notice the, uh, we have some not too distant cross relations here with the D sharp tonicizing E and then the D natural being a part of B minor, which is our tonic. We have C sharp, B, G, and E. We could call this a 2, 7 chord or a um, that would be C minor, C sharp minor seven flat five, but I think it's more likely that this B is a seven six suspension over the bass. This is actually a seven chord, seven six five, uh, A sharp fully diminished seventh over C sharp. And again, this is one of those cases where we see two and seven. I feel like this was a theme uh, that has become less prevalent in more recent videos, but something that I felt like I talked about in every video for like. I don't, I'm really bad with the episodes, but at least from like episode 50 through episode like 150, maybe even more than that, like I feel like I mentioned it like at least once every episode where two and seven are often, uh, they often occur with uh, as um, a chord where we have a difference in one, one pitch, right? Because they're a third apart, therefore their structure is going to be mostly similar in terms of the tones that are used to spell them. But here, it's not as uh, common as like the passing tone that we see here. Actually, the two is a part of a suspension. And then the, uh, the seven chord, which I feel is like the more accurate analysis here because we are sandwiching two, um, we're, well, we're sandwiching a seven chord between two one chords here. I feel like that's what feels like more of an appropriate analysis. Uh, D, B, F sharp, and D being one, six. So one, seven, one, six, very normative progression or the mirror of that progression, one, six, seven, six, one. A lot of the times it's not a fully diminished seventh chord, but there's no real reason why it can't be, or just a, dim or some type of diminished triad with the seventh on it in general. Um, most of the time it's just a diminished triad and first inversion, and it's pretty much always a, a diminished tri uh, seven chord and first inversion. I don't think I've ever seen one in a root position that isn't a byproduct of a subdivision. Uh, but yes, um, we have a passing tone in the bass, F sharp, B, F sharp, and C. This B is a 4-3 suspension over the bass. We know that F sharp major is being implied. We get the resolution on the next B, F sharp, A sharp, F sharp, and C sharp, our five chord. Delayed passing seventh here in the alto. And then we cadence not on B minor, but B major, B, F sharp, D sharp, and B, our major tonic triad. And Bach often ends his minor tri uh, minor chorales with a major version of the tonic triad, something very conventional for Bach. It's, it's something he virtually does all the time. He might, ha like a handful of times, he might not have done it. I feel like there have been a couple of chorales where he does not cadence on the major tonic, but the vast majority of the time he does in authentic cadences, that is, which are the cadences that you see virtually every time at the end of the chorale. Sometimes you see plagal cadences, sometimes you even see half cadence, but most of the time Virtually always you're going to see an authentic cadence, and in a minor key you could expect the chord to be minor. I mean, sorry, major. Uh, but that's going to wrap up today's analysis. Really not too much to talk about this chorale. It's a beautiful chorale, very um, plain in terms of the texture, uh, but I imagine that a lot of the chorales in, this, uh, in the Passion are going to be on the plainer side strictly from a pragmatic standpoint because there's like, what, 50 movements? maybe more in the um, in the entirety of the passion. So Bach was just generating content. And I imagine that for the sake of uh, keeping these sections more uh, connective in nature, that um, 
bridging the different movements that have much more activity like the solos and the duos um that the chorales are probably not the um the focus and we're probably going to see repetitious material as well um, maybe the use of similar text maybe the use of the same melody but there is going to be i imagine some continuity between the themes and i'm really excited to see that as well see if there's any congruence between the um or any congruent chord progressions but on top um yeah on top of that i think it's really going to be um it's really going to be a fun journey i'm excited to see how many chorales we have in the uh in the barrel for the future but regardless Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. If you are looking uh, to follow me along on this journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel, hit the notification icon, hit the like button. You know the drill. You've probably been on YouTube before. It helps me out a ton. And um, yeah, it's been incredible to see the channel grow so far. I'm over 100 subscribers now. It's really fantastic. I'm excited that I have so many people uh, actually actively watching the channel now that I'm getting into the St. Matthew Passion because I feel like this is going to be one of the more exciting um, moments on the channel that's going to be spanning over several days, which I'm very excited for. So uh, try not to miss that if you are a fan of Bach or if you're a fan of analysis or both. If you're a fan of both, you're definitely in the right place and I would love to have you along on the journey. But on that note again, thank you so much for watching the video. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis and I hope you take